Hello, literacy leaders and champions. Welcome to Literacy Talks. We are so excited to welcome you to this podcast series from Reading Horizons, dedicated to exploring the ideas, trends, insights, and practical issues that will help us all improve our professional practice in teaching reading. Our series host is Stacy Hurst, professor at Southern Utah University and chief academic officer at Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Joining Stacy are Donnell Pons, a recognized expert in literacy and special education, and Lindsay Kemeny, a Utah-based elementary classroom teacher. Today's topic is literacy pet peeves, and Lindsay Kemeny will start our conversation today. Okay, I'm excited to introduce our topic. So you guys know Tim Shanahan. He is a well-known figure in the literacy community, and he regularly posts articles on his blog. He's very knowledgeable about research and reading, and he's also known for saying things that are a bit controversial. He recently posted this article entitled, Do You Have Any Pet Peeves About Reading? And I thought that would be a great fun topic for our podcast today. So I want to throw the question out to you guys. Do you have any pet peeves about reading? Stacey, let's start with you. What is one of your pet peeves? So choosing just one would be tough, but I'm going to say that I don't love it when people say that English is crazy. And I don't love that for a lot of reasons, but a big one is that I think most of us know more now. We know better that there really are a lot of patterns and consistencies in our language, whether it's spoken or written, even considering all the changes that maybe have happened over time. But my biggest reason for having that as a pet peeve is because of the students who struggle. I think it's hard enough. And to hear a teacher say, or somebody who should know better say English is just crazy, that really is kind of defeating, I think. And I think we all know better now. We all know better. Yeah. That's all. So can you think of an example, Stacy, of something where like, tell us something that, you know, maybe most people might think, see, that's an example of how English is crazy, but how there is actually reasoning behind that. I think of the word love, for example, or even have, well, let's go with love because it's a little more complex and it looks like it might be pronounced love if we look at it in the spelling. But if we know two things, if we know that English words can't end in V, and we also know something that happened in the history of writing, which is the scribal O, <laughs> then that word would make more sense. So if there, if something seems to be an exception, there's usually an explanation. Yeah. I love that. And I love bringing those things uh, to the awareness of my students. For example, when we are practicing how to spell the word one, like the number one, we can map that. And that's a tricky one to map because the O is representing both the W and a, uh, and then the N is represented by the N-E. So we're going to go through kind of how we talked about how we introduced those high frequency words. But then I'm going to talk about, look at the word loan, lonely, alone. And we're going to talk about the meaning and they just think that's so cool. We're all word nerds and we love that kind of stuff, but it's so fun to show them. Yeah. Do you know, um, when I introduced the open syllable to my college students, I did this the other day and I had the question, well, what about the word to T O and what about do? And when I was able to explain those, their, their minds were blown. (laughs) Okay, okay so, so so explain them to us, Stacy. Well, those are the scribal O explanations. They used to be spelled T-U and T- T-O used to be spelled T-U, which makes sense. I don't know if all our listeners will know what that means, the scribal O. So a long time ago, <laughs> land far, far away, before the printing press, the way that we replicated print was to have scribes literally copy. And I don't know about you guys, if you've ever had that opportunity, but... I have, because in my middle school, if you chewed gum, the consequence was that you had to copy pages out of the dictionary. And I chose to chew gum and pay the price. (laughs) 
I think my vocabulary increased, <laughs> but I also had a really pained hand because copying is really hard after a while. It's hard on you. And the scribes would write in a cursive format. So anytime there was the U followed by a letter that they just wanted to keep going with, it was just easier to kind of turn into an O and keep going. And so that kind of stuck with some of our spelling conventions. And that's an example of one. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn it over to Donnell. What's one of your reading pet peeves? I'm going to have to lead with, because it still really bothers me and I hear it a lot and it comes in different forms, but it's the idea that IQ and reading are related. Oh. In other words, it's a mark of a high IQ if you read well. And if you don't read well, it's the mark of a low IQ. And it starts when, when children are young. You hear somebody say, well, my little guy started reading when he was three. He's very bright. Or someone might say in behalf of another person, oh, this little guy is so bright. He started reading when he was four. And it, it spreads this idea that reading and IQ are absolutely related. And we know that isn't true. And it led to making a lot of poor decisions too within schools, uh, that misconception. One of those would be that students who were struggling with reading but had a high IQ didn't need any help. Well, I guess they're lazy, They'll just, you know, not putting forth enough effort. And then it also likewise with students who had a lower IQ but could be good little readers because they didn't have a reading disability would be ignored virtually because, oh, their IQ is too low. So reading will probably be difficult. So a lot of poor decisions are made in schools based on that misinformation. And then the other thing is just the perception that people who struggle with reading have their whole lives felt like they weren't very bright because of reading. And so I think that's my number one pet peeve, I have to say, because it causes a lot of problems all the way around. Yeah, uh, that link between depression and dyslexia or reading struggles is just so strong. And it's so, I think we've all just witnessed the heartache and just these students who just, they have these feelings of worthlessness. They walk through the halls just dejected and not knowing what's wrong with them, thinking they're dumb when they're not they're bright. Yeah. And it shuts down a lot of dreams, you know, a lot of hopes and dreams for folks. And it's pretty early, especially with our people, our folks who have dyslexia, right? I think that's another thing. If we had a really good grasp on this, we wouldn't do the things that happen that you see happen. And we wouldn't do those things that are damaging. We'd have a better chance at not doing those things. And that I tell you, my goodness, we should be doing everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. I know that's what really helped my son. And it, was, it wasn't it was me that told him, but someone else that said, you know, dyslexics, um, a lot of them have a higher IQ, right? They're either average or above average, a lot of them. Yeah, that's a great one. Okay, Stacey, any thoughts on that before I move on to mine? Well, it is it is a great one. It makes me think of um, the discrepancy model too. Mm. Oh, yeah. It makes you wonder. If Don't that, get me started. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry to bring that up. So maybe, Donnell, your pet peeve and my pet peeve might fall into the area of misconception. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So to share my first one, I'm going to let you guys listen. I'm not going to tell you my pet peeve. You're going to listen to 30 seconds and see what my pet peeve is. Okay. 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 Here we go. Um, most of our books have a sticker, a white sticker on the bottom of the spine of the book that tells you the Lexile level. This book, Ramona the Brave, has a Lexile le level of 820. It means 820L. This is the Lexile level of that book. If you look at your card and this is within your range, this will be a good fit book for you. If your Lexile level is between 200 and 400, this book would be too high, too hard for right now. If your Lexile level is between 900 and 1,000, this book would be a little bit too easy. So we would find something a little bit more challenging. All right. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. Like I heard the chuckles. Yep. So nothing kills students' excitement about reading faster than having these restrictions. Like you can only <laughs> read, the, you know, between these certain levels. So this is a huge pet peeve of mine. And I have two stories kind of on, on two different ends of the spectrum here. One, my son with dyslexia, if he was only allowed to read the books he could actually read, like I'm thinking back to when he's in third grade, he would have only 
been able to have access to like little, simple, decodable kind of CVC, CVCE, those simple books. And he would miss out on all this, you know, grade level content and background knowledge and vocabulary. And of course, you know, this is where some audiobooks come into play, but there's also a lot of research that supports having students exposed to complex text. And when he was, it was about in third grade where we started reading chapter books together, where he would read a sentence, I would read a sentence, he would read a sentence, I would read a sentence. It took a really long time at first, but he was so proud of himself when we we finished that first book. I think our first chapter book was a Hank Zipser book. So if you guys know Henry Winkler, he has dyslexia and he has the series of books where the main character has dyslexia. My son loved those. And I just remember we were at an event in the end of that summer. And, you know, those books are probably like a third, fourth grade level. And so he introduced himself at this event and said his name and said, I have dyslexia, but I can read fourth grade books. No one's going to limit him to a certain reading level. And I just love that. And then on the other end, my other son, I have four children. So one of my other sons, he was in fifth grade and he read above grade level. His lexile was like, you know, seventh, eighth grade books. And his teacher, every time they read a book, they had to do a book report. All right. That's kind of a pet peeve within a pet peeve. Every because book. Then who yeah. wants to read, right? But anyway, and they had to get a certain amount of pages per turn. Well, my son was really into these diary of a Minecraft zombie books. Okay. <laughs> they're not the greatest literature. They're simple. They're like chapter books. I don't know. They're like 100 pages each, but there's tons of them. His teacher told him that he couldn't read those because they were too easy for him and that he should read books on his Lexile level. And I talked to her and I'm like, this is what he's interested in right now. Like if he can't read them now, then he'll never be able to, you know, and, (laughs) and maybe the books at our seventh, eighth grade level aren't necessarily appropriate for him. So this is where his interest is. We have no concerns about his reading. This is fine. And she kind of dug in her heels and said, (laughs) I will not accept any of the pages from these books. And, you know, I won't accept book reports from these. And I just kind of was like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to tell him, you know, to myself. I'm just like, well, I'm not going to tell him he can't read them. And so he read probably a thousand pages that she just wouldn't count. And I'm like, whatever, that's not important. What's important is that he likes to read, right? And he's excelling. Just kind of two different experiences. I mean, what kind of effect does an assigned, assigned reading level have on a child? Oh, I think you just hit on a pet peeve that might have taken me a week to get to. Related to that, it's this myth of reading levels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We just won't let go of that. But the, yeah. And so and, you can see the impact of that by the two examples you just shared. And Stacey, our mis- my, my, that conception, if you want to call it misconceptions about reading, ignoring the IQ, right? So yeah. this extremely bright child does have the ability to read and understand something, right? With support, yes. as Lindsay, yes. you read a sentence, he yeah. read a sentence, but definitely his mind is ready yeah. right, to yeah. accept that material and have those experiences. So again, I think, you know, the, they relate in many ways. You see them cross over each other. Yeah. Yeah. And I really credit that a lot to how well he's reading now. I mean, so we do the same thing now. He's re- reading Harry Potter. He's in sixth grade mm-hmm. and oh, man, those Harry Potter books are hard. I mean, we're like in the <laughs> sixth one and <laughs> he does awesome. I mean, now he's reading more than a sentence. He's reading longer, but I'm like, he can plod through those complex texts because we practice so much with them. Exactly. Yeah. He knows what so to in do that with. sense, we need to focus. It sounds like more on the reader. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. That's- Well, and those Lexile levels are really, we can't just limit them to a level and say, this is your, because on some topics, they're going to be able to read harder levels than on other topics. Yeah. But I think it's an easy connect the dots, right? Like, I feel like if we can keep curiosity alive in our students, it seems to come in spades when they're young. But at some point, probably about the time we start limiting their reading, <laughs> right? For one way or the other. And, and then, then also, oh. they're just going to learn more, right? They're going to, and if 80% of learning depends on reading anyway, then let them read what they're interested in. Yeah. And Lindsay, I liked what you said too about just allowing your son to just be in a text. You're not worried. You know, he's fine. And having practice with a text that, that is 
quite manageable for him is really good practice. Being in text that's easily manageable. Hey, that's right. awesome. Yeah. There's value to all of it. That's the thing. Setting up these limitations, coming up with arbitrary ideas mm-hmm. about what's a good experience with a text, right? Because that's arbitrary. You know, we don't know that that doesn't have value for him. I've not seen a specific study on that, right? Yeah. That says in that moment with that text, this isn't a good idea. Yeah. So I like that you stood up for your son and you let him read what he wanted to read because that's the biggest piece, engagement, right? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Our terrific trio is having fun sharing their pet peeves about reading and teaching reading. We're so glad you're along for the ride. Do you have some pet peeves and myths about reading and literacy you'd like to share? We'd love to hear from you. Share your thoughts at readinghorizons.com slash reading dash resources. So, okay, awesome. Well, I think we can go around and share another pet peeve. So <laughs> I, I hope you guys are ready for another one. Let's go back to Stacy. I know you had a list of them, you said. I do. And you know what? I, I it, what how do you draw the line between pet peeve and like I'm just angry about something? <laughs> and well, they cross over. Yeah. Right? Okay. I, yeah. It's yeah. Good. So my pet peeve really truly is it's big. It's real it's big, but we've all okay. suffered from it. And it really is that well, A, I'm bitter that we didn't learn what we needed to learn in college about teaching reading. And to add insult to injury there, it was, uh, that information was available, but I know our professors didn't know it or chose not to embrace it or whatever. And I think I'm at a point now where I'm angry because (laughs) we have to go to great lengths to make up for that. Mm -hmm. So we know in the state that we're in, which is Utah, uh, the state has purchased for school districts letters training which is fantastic training, but it's expensive and it's time consuming and teachers are busy already. Yes, they need it. It is critical and crucial. I am not going to say that that's not the case, but it's unfortunate that we have to spend the time and money to do that. I guess just to take it one little step further, we are now all of us in a situation where we do know better. We do. We have entire states saying they will not accept the three queuing system in any of their curricular materials. There's no reason for us to not be teaching things that are aligned with the science of reading in our college of education. There really is no reason. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, a little bit angry about that. I'm sure you could tell that coming through, but yeah, that would be my next one. <laughs> I think we've all experienced that. Why didn't I learn this in college? What? I just remember specifically when I learned that dyslexia is the most common learning disability. I was like, what? Why didn't I have a course on this? You know, know. Um, why don't I have professional development on this? Yeah. Why can't we even say dyslexia? Right. And then the other, I kept thinking about this. I think I've shared this with you two before, and I don't remember the year. I want to say it was around 2005. I was contacted by the university I graduated from because that was one of the first years they did the National Council of Teacher Quality Review on pre-service programs. And apparently the university that I graduated from came up on top in our state that year. And so they wanted to interview somebody who graduated from that university. Now at this point, I'm already a literacy coach. So I've already taught first grade. The national reading panel has had a huge impact on my career at this point. And they interviewed me and I even used the term science of reading before it was cool in the interview. It's in the Salt Lake Tribune. Wait, they you were, said you used it before it was cool? Is that what you just a- said? Apparently. Awesome. I, I, re- I recently, okay. within the last year, found the article and read it and I'm like, I said science of reading. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, but the whole time they were asking me questions and I was talking about the National Reading Panel and how hard it is for teachers to know what the latest research is and how to translate that into practice, whatever else I said the entire time I was thinking, but I didn't learn any of that in college. I didn't say it because I felt like that would be rude, but I was thinking in my mind, I didn't learn it there. I This was all me, <laughs> like reading stuff. Okay. So Donnell, I'm going to cut in front of you because... <laughs> <laughs> This leads into my pet peeves. Is that okay? For like, I remember I had a course in college on phonics and I was, I pulled out the book not too long ago because I'm like, no, I know I had a phonics class. What did I learn? And I'm like reading that book and it literally says that phonics should be used as a last resort. 
Oh. Um, so I was heavily taught the three queuing strategies, balanced literacy, whole language repackage. So my pet peeve is those that are resistant to stop using the three queuing strategies. And if you're not familiar with that, that's when you're reading a word based on the meaning, the syntax, the visual cues. This is those beanie baby strategies where it's like, look at the first letter, um, yes. look at the picture. Does it give you a clue? They're all guessing strategies. A lot of people will argue and say, I'm not teaching kids to guess, but you know, even the father of whole language, Ken Goodman called reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. So I just see that. I see some that I see a lot. I'm excited because a lot are are getting rid of these strategies, but there's a lot that are still fighting back. And I even just watched something with a, like a teacher edu celebrity who has, you know, sells on TPT and, and has her own blog. And she said, it's not, so, it's more about tweaking the strategy. So mm -hmm. the strategies, instead of saying, look at the picture first, you're going to, you know, switch that and use that last to, to figure out the word. And so it's just really alarming to me because it's not just that there isn't any research to support those strategies. Those strategies are doing damage, right? And yeah. I, I think we they're harming students. They're creating these terrible habits. They impede the process necessary for the students to store those words in memory. We need the students to map the sounds to the graphemes, to keep their eyes on the words, Dakota, all the way through. So Donnell, have you seen adults that that you work with who, who kind of depend on these three queuing strategies? So the adults that I work with have been drowning for years. And so they're leaning into anything and none of it is terribly efficient or effective. And most of them cannot honestly remember being given any strategy. They have very vivid memories of being out in the hall mm. on their own mm -hmm. because they weren't quote unquote getting it. Yeah. In fact, I have one who said the principal would walk by this man is in his 60s, and he remembers the principal walking by when he was in third grade and saying, you've been out here all day wow. and didn't do anything about it. Yeah. Those are the memories. Yeah. So they can't even remember having been taught a poor strategy. They, they don't remember being taught any strategy. Any strategy. Yeah. So I just see constantly with those little kids, that's what they already want to do is look at the picture and guess. We mm -hmm. don't need to teach them that, right? We've got to break that habit. We shouldn't encourage it. Stacy, you were telling us about an experience you had with one of your pre-service teachers. I was wondering if you could tell us about, about that test question she got. Do you oh, remember yeah. that? I'm going to have to, I don't know, have a Diet Coke after this or something. Because <laughs> you, you guys are triggering me. <laughs> yeah, we're riling you up. Okay. Yes. No, she texted me. It was 1030 at night. And she said, I am so mad that I got this question wrong. And she'd screenshotted it. So I thought... It was the quiz that I had given her. I thought she got one of my questions wrong, right? And I was like, I thought she was getting ready to, I don't know, negotiate to get it right. <laughs> but as I read the question, it was very specific to the three queuing strategies. In fact, it said teaching a student to look at the first letter in a word and guess the word and looking at the pictures. And then there was one other will help their reading development. And it was a true or false question. And she said false and got it wrong. And this was in, I teach obviously in the College of Education, but this was in a family life and human development course. I was so furious about that. And I, my instinct was to literally be like, who is the professor? I will be in their office tomorrow. We will have a conversation. But I, I texted back and said, how are you going to handle that? And she said, oh, I just sent them all three of Emily Hanford's articles. Like, I'm like, thank you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to handle it. And it was my student advocating for it. So it's still happening, still happening. Yeah. Even at a university where the science that goes into reading is being taught. Yeah, I believe it. Because at, at first I thought, oh, people are switching. And, and now I'm seeing statements online and in Facebook groups and different things. And I'm like, ah, oh, no. And there are people that they are, they're resistant. They're saying, you know, someone posted a video, but listen to this kindergartner. You're going to tell them that they're not reading you know, and they're just obviously just memorize the pattern of the book. But anyway, we're almost out of time. So Donnell, let's, let's go back to you. What's your last pet peeve that you want to share with us? So very quickly, just the last one is reading is done by third grade. That's a huge pet peeve. Oh, yeah. oh that we're, we're all done by third learn, grade. Learning to read, reading to learn that one. Yeah, that whole thing. And that's a can of worms we could talk about for a whole session too. But just developmentally doesn't make a lick of sense, right? Developmentally and the differences that we have developmentally and the needs of students, but that does a lot of harm. That idea that, yeah, it's all done by third grade. Yeah. Yeah. 
There's still so much to do. I love that. Okay. I love that you guys. So to kind of recap our pet peeves, I guess we have our six then that we share today. So English is not crazy. IQ and reading are not related. They're not the same thing. We can't limit a child to their lexile levels. We talked about the frustration of not learning what we needed to in college. And now we're kind of paying the price as we're trying to make up for that. We need to get rid of those three queuing strategies. And it's hard when we find some that are resistant to that. And then we our reading instruction continues. We're not done by third grade. So I think that's a good list, you guys. And you started the podcast talking about Timothy Shanahan. And we can end by doing the same thing because he wrote two blog posts because apparently he had more pet peeves. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm sure we could keep going too. <laughs> we pet peeve part two. <laughs> we might need to. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. That was an awesome yeah. discussion. And thanks everybody for joining us. We will see you next time. Thanks for joining us today for Literacy Talks, the podcast series for literacy leaders and champions everywhere. Literacy Talks comes to you from Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Join us next time.